Hello, Vicky. Good. No, I was Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, April meeting, I mean the March meeting of uh, Mayor and Council of the Work Session. Uh, this uh, 30th day of March 2017 at 3 o'clock. And uh, before we get started uh, and I ask about the agenda, I would like to recognize that today is Councilman Shirley Marchman's birthday. And she's going to kill me for this. Happy birthday. <coughs> No, I'm not going to sing. I don't want to run everybody off. Uh, review of the agenda or any changes to the agenda that we have as printed? Mr. Mayor, one, one item that I noticed is not on the work session agenda that we ought to put, add on here, uh, and that is the charter change amendment that we first talked about at our last meeting and should be coming up again next Tuesday. That's on the uh, provisions to change two sections of the charter dealing with the hiring of a city manager. Would you like to add under tab F number four? As a matter of fact, I would. That would be perfect. Any other changes to the agenda? Okay. If not, moving into tab A, community development, Ms. Vicki Coleman. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. This is a request um, by Mr. Doug Dickinson to rezone 47.45, excuse me, 0.73 acres along Edge Road from rural development to light industrial. Um, actually, if you can, no, 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 the one that Sarah just pulled up. Uh, this is a request. Um, it's essentially what's being proposed is an industrial subdivision, if you will. And when she pulls the um, layout. No. The proposal uh, seeks to, the initial request was to expand uh, the existing industrial the expansion would go over into an area that is proposed for, in terms of the future land use map for residential, uh, low density residential, one to four units to the acre. The surrounding um, future land uses are also residential, um, low density as well. The majority of what is surrounding it is vacant, undeveloped, however, what there is a corner of the parcel that is proposed that would also that currently exists as single family detached homes. Um, what they're proposing as light industrial, as you can see before you, would be several lots. Staff recommendations based upon what the surrounding land uses are proposed for, as well as what some of those existing uses are. <coughs> the staff recommendation is uh, denial based on consistency with the comprehensive plan, as well as the surrounding land uses that are proposed and what currently exists. And I believe planning and zoning also Yes, um, recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission was support of staff uh, recommendation, which was denial um, of the request, and that was a three to zero um, vote. So we had, sorry, we had two Planning and Zoning Commissioners absent? That, that is correct. Okay. Who was that? Okay, and John Mount, he told me I, okay, I spoke yes, to him. Okay. Like Any questions from yeah, council? I'd like to get a copy of what's on the screen here because we didn't get that. That actually was the smaller version was just sent to us. The larger one we got uh, really the morning of the meeting, and it was just too large for you guys to manage. But I'll, I'll certainly forward you a copy. I literally just got that 15 minutes ago. Okay. I've only talked to one commissioner so far, but I'm going to go out and look at the <coughs> property. Because I just find it hard to make an assessment and make a decision on something like this that I haven't gone out and seen what we're talking about. 
I'm with you. I need to go take a look at what the lay of the land is, but I do know, being on the development authority, that um, industrial development, we are hurting for land, so I'll have to take a close look at it because we could use all we can find. We're running out of industrial land. What did you say? We're hurting for what? Industrial land. We just about used it all up. Vicky, Ms. Vicky, as I understand it, there are no proposed businesses that have indicated they're going to move in here. This would just be a classification change. So we, we really, you know, it'll be in the light industrial category, but we don't have any businesses that we know of. That is correct. So you're looking at uh, a number of lots where it would essentially be wide open in terms of anything that falls in that land, light industrial land use category. At this point in time, there are no specific um, uses that have been identified to go into what the subdivision so that right now it's zoned for residential yes it's um, rural development could mm -hmm. you give some examples of light industrial light industrial would um it differs from let me just say what would be more of your heavy industrial which would be more of your manufacturing this was probably um Oh, the businesses on Liberty Road, are those light industrial? Those are oh. zone, uh, there's a portion of it that is zoned for light industrial. Um, but I would literally have to look at the map. Some of those uses are um, commercial. So without knowing, I mean, some of your industrial can take less intensive uses. So I'd have to look at the map to. Could you pull out that part of the uh, code that shows us what's. Allowable light in light industrial? Yes, Absolutely. Please. We do have representatives from our Planning and Zoning Commission here. If uh, the council so desires to hear, as I understand it, we had a, a packed house. On Tuesday. Mm -hmm. What is your desire? We're not actually taking any action on it tonight. Okay, any other questions? No, we're just trying to understand it. <laughs> okay. Item two. Um, the second item, uh, and let me say it may actually be helpful to take the discussion with item two and three concurrently. Um, what you have is a request by Green Community Development, represented by uh, Mr. Christopher Hunt, to annex and rezone a portion of Church Road. Um, there are 10 acres, and I'll just give you some of the uh, addresses, 903, 905, 1001, and 1009 South Van Wert and uh, Zero Church Road. The desire of the applicant is to annex and rezone the 10 acres um, from what is Carroll County's designation right now of agricultural to plan development. In Carroll County's uh, class, uh, that particular designation has a four acre minimum it would be coming the request is to bring it into the city as planned development um, just to give you an idea of what currently exists in the area the to the south of this particular property and i'm sorry elisa if you don't mind um, pulling the other site plan up so that you can lay that show that layout but to the south of uh, this particular property on Church Road, the developments are um, essentially residential. They are approximately two units to the acre, so more or less half acre lots. Uh, to the north put, of Church Road. Could you put this one up so we can see the area? Oh, see the area. The one shows the area where it's going to go in. Do you want to wait for her to pull it up or? Yeah. We'll all look at the same thing. It's one of the. 
Yeah. Nope. That's, it. That's, That's it. it. It's this thick. She's so, having a hard time finding it. As you can see on the site plan uh, to, to the south, there are two uh, subdivisions that currently are developed out at, you might want to zoom out just a little bit. Um, again, those are it's approximately, approximately two units to the acre uh, for the site that is proposed on the north side of Church Road. It's vacant, undeveloped, but it's essentially surrounded by um, more or less low density uh, residential or vacant, undeveloped land that is designated for uh, in this within the city limits what would be low density uh, residential one to four units to the acre uh, is the area in question the one that's got the blue line on it um, that's that is part of that's part of it I thought there was one more it includes those other four lots doesn't it it includes the, the four lots so it's Representation. I had trouble. It looks like it's, it's this. Um, the probably I would certainly say we had a public hearing only at this last uh, planning commission meeting. Part of that, the staff has sent out notice to Carroll County uh, as required to put them on notice that there is an application for annexation um, to the city. We are still waiting on the final response from Carroll County. Uh, the city is un not able to take any action on the item until we have received our responses back from <coughs> Carroll County within their defined time frame to respond. So this is going to be, next huge will be a public hearing only? Correct. No action taken? No action taken. Well, that's good because <laughs> um, I have to go out and see that one too. I have a question though. Yes. Um, you're saying that this is, I understand the four acre rural, it, because I used to live out off of um, Boyd Road for a little while, and that's the way they had to sell things out there. Right. Um, but you said there's these other developments around it that are two to an acre? They're or? developed two units to the acre. Um, now, did they get some sort of. It, it was certainly answer. explained to me um, that those actually were. Uh, zoned by the city at, at an earlier time and I guess apparently a de-annexation happened I don't have all of the documentation oh, yeah. but because okay. um, that that's why sense. they are developed at a higher density than what would be um, once it went back into the county they gave their uh, future land use designation of uh, four acre minimums so it's it's a it's a combination of of course anytime you're doing your evaluation of uh, you're looking at what the future land use plan calls for but also what is the actual development and how has it occurred mm -hmm. um, so you're really kind of looking at both of those so does anybody here know that history no nope. did it get de-annexed <coughs> and was the city or okay the, 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 the de-annexation the de-annexation history was took place in the late 1980s and the legislature annexed what I've always called as the donut around the city of Villarica. It was annexed in and it stayed that way for maybe four years and the citizens in the donut around the city of Villarica were not happy with the city services and convinced the state legislature to take them back out of the city. So we went from a population of about 4,000 to about 10,000 back to about 7,000 <laughs> at the time based on those two actions. Um, and that, that very well could have been an area that was annexed and then de-annexed. Um, Mr. Macklin, is the process going to be we had to annex it before we can rezone it? Yes. Both. Right. And that's one of the reasons why you see the, the two separate items. We'll take it for discussion. But once you annex, um, in addition to the, you'll have to give it a future land use designation as well as then uh, you would rezone the property. Um, I would point out that the least intensive future land use designation that you have is residential one to four units to the acre. So um, I'd certainly want you to just uh, be aware of um, what that would mean for somebody that would be proposing uh, that is coming forward with a 10 acre minimum, like where the range that it's possible for them to bring development in. Um, 
I would also point out um, the biggest uh, source of discussion on Tuesday night, of course, is aside from the issue of the zoning, is uh, the development standard related to um, the city, um, specifically related to sewer and the provision of sewer. Um, for anyone that's proposing a subdivision, if you are within two, uh, 2,000 feet of an existing sewer tie-in, you will be required to tie into the sewer. If you are beyond that 2,000 feet, then the requirement is basically that you propose, um, you have the opportunity to propose an alternative means of uh, treating um, what would be any type of uh, wastewater. So the discussion, um, that's more or less where we are. And in this particular case, what you're seeing is the proposal of these lots, um, but there is a community septic uh, component that they are requesting um, be considered uh, uh, as a means of really addressing that issue. Of um, as I understand it, that's an open air spray type system. It's not an enclosed and um, susceptible to a lot of smell from what I've heard from other locations. But the how far away are they from our sewer? They are, um, it's hard to say. I took the, just with me measuring um, at one of the locations at um, along 78 where it ties down into, I forget the last road, it was already over 2,500 feet just to get to the intersection of uh, South Van Wert and 78. Wow. So I didn't even bother continuing down. Um, anything else outside of that uh, would be, you know, doing easements across, you know, property. So. Uh, okay. I assume they're going to be here Tuesday then. If they're not here today, they were at planning and zoning to do some sort of presentation. Yes, they'll be here on Tuesday. Let me look this. I don't see him, so. And Vicki, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, what was there? They took no action. It was public hearing only. That's right. I'm sorry. Um, so the new. staff recommendation um, will be presented to uh, Planning Commission and uh, City Council for the May agenda. Because didn't this come up rather quickly? It came up quickly, and uh, part of that, it just, it ended up, going on the other items that were advertised as well so we just again making okay. sure that we comply with the standard we just said we'll open it up for comment so as i understand it tuesday we'll just have a public hearing and we won't vote on this that is, is that correct? correct okay <laughs> any other questions of staff thank you vicky real quick i'm, I'm sorry. sorry um not so much a question but this whole new septic thing mm -hmm. was a brand new education for me so i read through all that I don't know how familiar it is to you all, but I expect the staff's going to present us some information on research having to do with that that can enlighten us a little more. I can. There, there are some examples um, around Georgia. Um, you know, we've done something similar in other jurisdictions that I've worked in, but we had total transfer development rights to be able to accomplish, uh, you know, similar things. As I understand, there's one of these systems in Hiram, so we might be able to take a trip. It, and I would just like to add to that that, that um, I appreciate your efforts in doing that, but the applicant really needs to be the one to bring his proposal Precisely. to us. Precisely. And that's, that's one of the things, that, and just so that you are aware, I did let the uh, applicant know that, you know, it's, it's part of his doing his due diligence to come in and inform you and to really um, provide you guys with, he's really the applicant, so he's here to make the case for this uh, d development. Correct. Um, Mayor, the reason I mention that is the developer is going to give his point of view of why it's good, <laughs> which is fine. That's what a developer would do. I just want to make sure we might balance it out with someone that says, but it can be good, but here's maybe the other side of it. I just want to make sure we get the whole story, not just the person selling it. Sure. So, sure. Okay. Vicki, let me ask you a question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I know when we're talking about density, the number of homes you can put on each acre is tied to the type of septic system you have, whether it's septic or sewer. Right. Would this system allow them to treat those lots as though they're on sewer? Because when you're on sewer, you can have much smaller smaller building lots. Is that what this system would allow? 
Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Let me come back. When part of our discussion with him is, you know, being able to make a determination um, of whether the total number of developable lots, what that's actually going to look like based on, you know, the research and the results that come back. Now, I'm certainly not necessarily the engineer, so that's part of on what his engineers should be studying to come back and to give us, you know, some answers on what's ultimately developable versus what our maximum uh, um, allowable by zoning and where the disparity may be. Now, granted, he's not asking for the maximum. He's only asking for, I think, roughly 2.3, but maybe it is a, a, the case that he may not get to the 2.3. So we'll get guidance from there. I don't know if that's really answering your well, question. It is. I, 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 I think just to add into that is that community, uh, community's sewage system does not equal a public sewage system. Okay. And so I, I think there is a difference between the two. And that's going to impact what he could ultimately do with the property. And I think he needs to be aware of that. But ultimately, we do need to know more about this type of system. So the same right here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Tab B, Public Works. Charles Davis, come forward. <laughs> it might be. You won't have to back those trucks over the holes, right. maybe. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, have today to bring to you the uh, consideration for purchase of an asphalt roller that was budgeted in the 2017 budget. Spent quite a little time with our street department manager looking at these. Uh, he promises me he can do a much better job of patching our potholes if he has proper equipment to do it, and I tend to agree with him. The uh, I'd like to see them start rather than just going out and throwing the stuff out of a truck and backing over it, doing a square cut, cleaning out the hole four inches, and then using this piece of equipment, which has a wide enough roller. Since it's 48 inches, it'll bridge most of our potholes, so that's on two late level parts of ground, making that a level repair. And uh, I know it's a large sum of money, but I believe that uh, Back when we had one several years ago before the engine went out, they did use it pretty often, and it was smaller than this. I had two uh, bids that are close to us. There's some other manufacturers out there, but the distance from us to have service and parts makes that kind of impractical. The uh, Dynapack was one that uh, was specifically mentioned. I also went by Caterpillar, which we have a really good relationship with and have much better availability of parts and service and just much bigger facility up there. I'm sure you're all familiar with it just past Six Flags on the left there. It is a little bit more money. The I think it's roughly $1,000 difference, but it won't take long to offset that and the serviceability of it and uh, the availability of parts. The Caterpillar is also on state contract. The uh, Dynapact is not, so if you were buying the Caterpillar off a of state contract, it's nearly $20,000 more money, so it's, it's a lot more machine for the money. But uh, if any questions, I'd be glad to answer them beyond that. I guess my question is to our acting city manager over here. This is a budgeted item. We have the money. So yes, sir. There's $63,000 in the budget for it under uh, Carroll no, County Capital. Law. So we're under that amount. We're under that amount, yes, sir. And let me just say something about, you know, Charlie touched on it, but the difference in, you know, what happens now with small potholes is they put cold patch in them or, or hot patch and then they roll over it with the truck tires. And uh, being in the asphalt industry, the, the, uh, the, the proper way to do it is to saw cut that out uh, and then uh, apply the hot mix and then come in and roll it with a sufficient enough roller that, that you uh, get compaction. So I think this is going to pay dividends way, way, way down the road. Uh, my only question is, do we have a trailer? that we can actually haul it on. We do. We have a large tilt trailer. We'll add a winch to the front of it, and uh, that'll be a couple thousand dollars, but we have money to do that, and it will be able to load it on and off of it. It's actually the trailer we pull the backhoe on, so it's plenty capable. Good deal. And I, I would like to see this just be the beginning of what we do in the years ahead for asphalt, you know, 
with all the other asphalt things we have going on in town. <laughs> I'd like what, to see what, us. What might that be? <laughs> I, I'd like to see us try to work towards uh, maybe doing a little more of these things in house as years go on, and we have the money to buy some equipment to go with this. But this would be a good start. Which one are you recommending, Dynapack or I'd, Caterpillar? I'd recommend the Caterpillar due to service and availability. We have a really good relationship with Caterpillar, and most of our newer equipment we have bought in the recent years has been Caterpillar. So we're kind of headed in that direction. You've got me. All the neighbors on my side of town will be very happy to have something that fixes those potholes and keeps them fixed longer. Any, any other questions? No, yeah, I like this idea too, Charlie. A lot of those uh, patch jobs are no, they're not as they're not too good. Now, according to uh, by comparison to some of the recent work we've had, they look pretty good. But uh, I'm in favor. I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> you don't have to. He'll open that door for you. For you. <laughs> I've been there a while. Okay. All Thank right. you, Charlie. Thank you. Tab C, Sarah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. This is our financial update for February, which is 16.7% through the month for those of you that like percentages. At the top, you'll see our general fund, which again covers our um, government type activities, which is administration, police, recreation, public works. Um, you can see our cash there is 7.1 million at the end of February, higher than in later months of the year because we've gotten in all, all of our property tax. Our unassigned fund balance there, that's our reserve is 6.3 million. That'll be updated once we have our audit completed here in the next month or two. Um, that next box is our major revenue sources, the first one being sales tax or local option sales tax, lost. Um, you can see we're slightly higher, 3% higher than last year. Property tax, um, we've only received $27 because um, we've received money in 2017, but it's all booked back to 2016. Um, we'll receive the 2017 property tax at the end of the year and going into 2018. $27, really? Yeah. <laughs> Occupational tax, these are our business licenses. This, uh, we are 6% higher than last year. And then that next box is our fund overall. So $11.9 million in the revenue expense budgeted. Um, our revenue is slightly lower than last year, um, but our expense is 9% lower than last year. Um, and I was just looking to see what that was. Um, in this year's budget, we are only spending 30% of the bond payment from general fund, whereas in the past it was 50-50, so um, that's why it does look like less. Going on to the water sewer fund, our operating cash there is a negative $545,000. Again, not, not a negative balance in the bank, um, just part of our pooled cash is negative, but if you remember last month it was over a million dollars negative, so we've made up some ground there. Um, investments, we do have a, a $2 million CD, um, and you can see our outstanding bond principal. And then the reserve in that fund is $1.4 million, which is just shy of a three-month um, reserve. Um, again, that'll be updated after audit. Next, you can see our major revenue sources, the water and sewer sales. Um, water and sewer slightly less than last year, but I have to look at when we have our revenue coming in in January, a percentage, it, a percentage of it is due back to 2016, so I've just done that entry. Fund status, you can see the budgets there, revenue and expense, just over $7 million for both, um, and both slightly less than last year. We're only two months into the year, so I think it's not the best time to compare yet, but it, it's at starting point at least. And lastly is solid waste, and our cash is negative $230,000, and our equity is, is negative as well. We've talked about that over the past few months. Um, hoping we have sent out the RFP, so Hopefully we can get some of this stuff resolved in the next few months. Uh, revenue status, that, that's our solid waste, um, the amount that we get from the customers for that. Uh, it is lower than last year. 6% in this fund, though, um, is only, I believe, it's just over $10,000. So it's not necessarily a large number. And then fund status overall, again, the revenue is lower. But the same thing, I have to attribute some of it back to last year. And then our expense is slightly higher by 1%. Any questions on that? Okay. Item two. Moving on to this next item. This is a request for approval of a budget amendment for 2016. This is kind of just housekeeping. In December, the council approved <coughs> to pay the Georgia State Patrol $191,000 um, 
this was, like I said, it was approved and paid in December. I just need a budget amendment to clean up the, the books for 2016. So my proposed amendment would increase the expense for that line item and then use fund balance for that. I recommend fund balance since it's a one-time payment and I didn't have anywhere else to take it from. So <laughs> that's my recommendation on that. Um, my, oh, I'm sorry. My only question is this. It was unbudgeted. We know what it's about with keeping Georgia Patrol local and everything else and going in with Carroll County to help. Um, but it's coming out of fund balance. So do we have a plan on how to replace that money that we're taking out? So we don't like keep, I mean, you, you can go in, take stuff out of your savings. I just don't want to see us keep doing it and it's, get ourselves in where we can't, aren't replacing what we need there. I would agree. And then this year when we're setting our tax rate, we can look at things that have come out of the reserve in the past uh, year. Because we okay. did have several things. I think the purchase of butter balls and things, those all came out of the reserve. Um, and we addressed that one in 2016, so in 2017 we can see what else has come out of the reserve. Hopefully nothing, but um, we'll take that into account when we calculate our tax rate. I think that's a fantastic idea. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Number three. Okay. I wanted to update the council on a change in pay methodology. I don't know if Stephanie wants to join me. This was a joint effort between HR Director Stephanie and I. Um, at the beginning of the year, when we were finalizing the budget, started looking at different pay calculations for folks. Um, for instance, when someone is hired, Stephanie will calculate based on years of experience, education, um, certifications. That gives us a, an idea of what this person should be paid within their pay range. Um, started noticing when we were looking at people side by side, we realized that um, some employees with many years of experience were far, far behind employees that may have had the same experience but had education. So in the past, the calculation had been skewed more towards people with education. Um, so we started doing some research at other government type entities, um, education, um, graduate or college university systems to see how other people were taking those experience education certification items into play when they calculate people's pay. Uh, you can see that chart there is kind of what we settled on and I think it um, basically puts a narrative to how people should fall in the pay, pay range. So it's based on quarters. So you can see if someone comes in, they meet the minimum qualifications, they're entry level, then you would expect them to be at the bottom or at least in the first quarter of that pay grade. Um, if someone has previous experience, um, but yet they are mostly independent, can function at their job, may need additional training, um, they might be in the second quarter. Um, the third quarter of their pay grade, this would be someone who meets your preferred qualifications. You know, when we set out a job description, um, we're trying to hire somebody, we say what the minimum qualifications are, but then we also um, explain preferred qualifications. So if you brought someone in that came in with not just the minimum, but, but with preferred, um, and perhaps they're a seasoned um, person in their career, you would want them to be a little bit further up in their, in the, within the pay grade. And then lastly, if you have someone who's a subject matter expert or someone who is senior level, um, you would expect that they would be higher in the pay grade. So that was, we were trying to put words to where people should fall in the pay, pay grade. So from there, we went and, um, oh, and I don't know if I need to give any more points. Um, so before, again, I said people with um, education, you can see this on the second page in your packet, people with education, um, so if you have two people with 20 years experience, but one only had a high school diploma, they would only get a percentage of points compared to someone with the same 20 years experience, but they came in with a master's degree. Um, so now what we... Right, bachelor's, master's, any of that. Um, now we are trying to weight it more evenly, or more importantly, we're looking at the jobs. So the jobs, certain jobs require um, a certain level of experience or education, and um, but others do not. And so we're trying to rate it more on that. So experience, um, you get points based on your years. Um, for instance, when we go back to that chart, someone with 20 years experience, we would hope would fall more mid-range in that, um, in their pay range. Education, um, this is, instead of just um, giving them, this would be de determined whether they have, whether that position required it or it was preferred. And then um, certification based on two things, whether it was occupational or professional. Because you have people who have been certified after they sat in a class for one day versus you have people that have studied 
for a long time and taken multiple courses based on their experience in education, those are two different types of certifications. So from there, once we kind of set what we wanted it to look like in place, then we looked at, Stephanie and I spent two days, I think, locked in her office, and we looked at every employee. We, put, we plugged them into this matrix to see who, where are people, um, where are the biggest discrepancies, where are people this far off. And again, what we found was people who have been here a long time, people with lots of experience, they were the ones with the biggest gaps in where they should be. Um, so this was, this is, um, we're hoping this will be the next part of our pay parity uh, at the beginning of the year or when the budget was approved, so mid-January or so. Um, we did do pay parity for the lowest employees. That only took up a portion of the, the pay parity pool that we had. Um, so with this, this will not make people whole. It's not enough to bring people up, but I think it's enough to help. Um, and we'd like to go ahead and get that done as soon as possible so they can get the benefit of most of the year um, at a higher rate. How many, how many people are we talking about here that are not um, up to the level you're expecting to be? Right. It was between 40 and 45. It's changed because we, we've actually lost some people. I don't know if Chief wants to speak to that. I know state police um, are paying higher. So <coughs> you Re Recently, law enforcement with the state uh, received a 20% increase across the board. Uh, so state patrol, motor carriers, any GBI, any of their offices or officers received a 20% increase. With that, we've already lost two officers and believe we're probably going to lose two more. And uh, when, when you're talking about these guys are going to go in within the first, the second year, make 50, 55,000, it's just hard to compete with that. So I, I definitely support this, and it'll help those people that have stayed a while get those increases they've deserved and hopefully keep them here and, and keep them loyal. So I, I just yeah. want to come in, Stephanie and, and Sarah, for y'all putting this together. I had asked y'all to, to work on this and, and come back with a methodology. And uh, I want to point out the, the before and after. If you see that in there, the, uh, before, employees only receive credit for experience based on their education. This did not make sense for the positions that did not require ed college education. Certification credit was minimal. Now, the experience, education, and certifications are weighed separately. And I think that that at least for me, uh, that, that suited what I think pay parity means, and I, I commend you all for doing this. That's I mean, the part I think I like the best, because in other forms of government I've seen where, because you have a degree, you get this, and you get another degree and you get more. I mean, you may be useless, but you've got that degree and you're getting paid more, and I like the fact that experience comes in. Now, the one thing that makes me a little bit uncomfortable, though, and I know you all probably didn't have time to do this before now, um, I feel uncomfortable that we don't have a city manager, permit not you, <laughs> permanent city manager to evaluate this too. That's my uncomfortability with it. I definitely like some of the aspects. I found a little bit of it confusing when you're doing the, the core tiles. There's some of that I might have to ask a little bit more about. But right now I can't even formulate the question for you. Um, but that that's the thing that just makes me a little uncomfortable. I'd really like a city manager to look over this and give us some feedback, too. In 2009, when the pay scale was developed, who developed it? Um, ARC. ARC. Yeah. Okay. Well, when we were looking at the budget, I looked at every employee, um, and I was pretty surprised at disparity uh, in pay and so I'm glad you all took a look at this I didn't know that the mayor had asked you to do it but I, I like this particular line we want to be pro-education in certain jobs but the employees shouldn't be punished if their job doesn't require a college education and I appreciate you all going back and taking a look at that because I do think that we as the chief said are at risk of losing uh, some of our long-term employees because of this stuff so I appreciate it how many of the 40, 45 are in the police department? Quite a few. Maybe you can tell me, Chief. I would say about What's your chief 25 to 30 percent, maybe a little bit more. Oh. There's several of them, but uh, I don't think it's half. I really appreciate that y'all looked at everybody, too. Maybe a little bit Detail. But That's no, why you had to lock yourself half. in that room, right? Because <laughs> I imagine that took some time. Further questions? Not I think now. So. Maybe later. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Item four. Okay. 
This deals with the CDBG project. That grant was due on April 1st, and the city did submit for that. We won't find out until the fall whether we received the $750,000 for the grant. Um, this is part of that. This is our previous interim city manager and the public works director and I sat with the engineering firm Goodwin Mills and Kaywood and they it's in your packet the presentation um, I don't know if we saw the presentation at that point but the pre preliminary engineering report and their estimated budget for the project um, this it's already done and so even though the project isn't won't begin until the grants approved until the fall um, since CDBG is on the brain, I wanted to go ahead and bring you the engineering contract. Um, I think we should go ahead and get that approved. Um, and maybe Mr. Mecklen can speak about this, but I would think we should approve it contingent on whether we receive the grant, because I don't know if the project will go forward if oh, we don't get the question. grant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, certainly that's something that we can do. It's no point in having a contract if we don't have a, a grant to administer. <laughs> So they, they give us 750000 and we had to supply the rest? Yes. Um, this is in the middle or so of your packet. The total estimated project at this point is $1,179,000. And the portion that would go to this engineering firm, if you approve it, would be 111584 That is for the, and they, they're going to handle several components. That's the, the engineering, which you can see is already done preliminary, preliminarily. Um, they would handle the bid for the contractor, they would oversee the contract, um, the construction, <coughs> and then post-construction as well. I assume the preliminary, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask, do we know whether or not we have ever worked with this firm before or have gotten any references from them, about them? We have used them before, I'm not sure on which project. Stevenson Palmer was the name of the Oh, firm. okay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I forgot. Why did they change your name? I mean, <laughs> I merge, you know. Probably merger. <laughs> have they, um, they've obviously done other projects. Have we looked into that? They have done other projects. I'm not sure which ones. Yeah, I think we can look into that. Uh, Stevenson Palmer, I'm pretty sure we have done work with them before, yeah. and we need to go back and look and make sure that they are not a group that we've ever had problems with because we've obviously had problems with some engineering firms before and I just want to double check to make sure they're not one of I don't think they are though. Especially since they change your name. I like <laughs> you always get suspicious when you start changing it. <laughs> That's <name>. moving companies. <laughs> um. Just for the public, uh, we're talking about water infrastructure around North Avenue and the target area is approximately 63 acres or 10 city blocks. And uh, this, this focuses on replacing deteriorated six inch cast iron mains and one and a half inch galvanized steel distribution lines which service the area. And this is part of an ongoing uh, process to try to replace our water lines which are in pretty bad shape. So uh, it, it's a pretty big pie if you try to eat it all at one time, but if you, if you slice it off a little bit at a time, I think we'll eventually get there. So this is a, another step forward. Thank you so much for explaining that because if you're sitting out there what? A lot of that is our ward, Ms. Marchman's and mine, and there's concern about whether you could even put a fire out in some areas with the pressure, and we, we've seen pictures of those pipes. That, I mean, they need to be done, so this will be great if we get this grant. My only question is, you said something about they had done preliminary work. I assume that's the preliminary work for us to be able to present in the grant application? Yes. Okay. That was all done for the grant, so... And then we'll have a contract that's contingent that will kick in if we get the grant. Correct. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Further questions? If not, thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, Chris is not available tonight. Uh, he's in training. So the next items that you have, he would be presenting. Uh, if you want to give us some direction, we'll be glad to do that. If you want to table it, that's up to you. A, a few you. of them I can speak to. Okay. <clears throat> the, uh, number one there on the West Georgia Jazz Festival, 
this is a contract that was the Chris did send to me and I've reviewed. It is an identical contract to the one that we had last year for this event right. between the city and the olive tree. The olive tree <coughs> is one of the holders of an alcohol beverage license within the city and they're proposing to do the exact same thing that they did last year whereby uh, the city will receive 50% of any of the income that's received and that Olive Tree would receive the other 50%. Did we have any trouble last year with this event? No. No. Ghost. No. They were, the Olive Tree is very responsible and have been in all their interactions with the city. And that's my only concern because it's going to come up again with the Velcro pygmies, I think. Right. It's just that if you want to show up with your kids and your family, you don't want somebody overly intoxicated. You want to have a nice family environment. Right. Well, the way it was handled last year also, it was, uh, you know, we had a fence up around the entire perimeter of the facility. So, and, and I think the police department has acted with the, the right amount of discretion in the past. Of if, if somebody it appears to be misbehaving, they're asked first, escorted second off the premises. And, and we really had no problems at all at the Jazz Festival last year. I was going to make a comment about the fence. If, if we're going to continue to do this, and, and you know, there's a there's a part of me that that uh, that is not for this type of event because I think the Mill Amphitheater was built uh, with a community in mind, and uh, and I'm not trying to be a greater than thou kind of person up here. But if we're going to continue to have these events uh, with uh, alcohol served there and I would just ask that we consider putting up something a little bit more permanent than portable fence or safety fence uh, around it because it really does take away from the, the way that facility looks. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, that would, that's one concern. And the other concern, and I heard this from con some constituents, this does not mean that you can bring your cooler full of beer or wine to the event. It's for purchase at the event only. Correct. And I have <clears throat> one thing I think this is not anything for this meeting, but over the course of time, we need to continue to study exactly what we do need to have out there, whether or not the fences are the best thing, whether or not uh, we can we can have uh, try different things. So far, we've just tried to take baby steps in in regard to this and and tried to keep it a very controlled event, which is I think what the citizens here want. Uh, but we are going to be at least asking and trying to get examples of other places just to see what works elsewhere Amen. and consider whether or not to make any changes. We and I love the baby step approach. I just don't think we'd want to wrap our baby in a newspaper. I'd rather <laughs> put a diaper on. If we're you gonna. remember, well, you were in a different position, but remember how long we talked about fencing, removable fencing? I mean... What was it six months, nine months, a year? I don't know. At least a year. I yeah, know. we beat it till it was dead, and it, it died. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's still something that I think we're going to have to consider. I think what happened was the we were going to have a promoter that was going to come in. They were going to do several events a year, and that, that didn't pan out. So it didn't make sense for us to spend the money for something that wasn't going to happen. If this is going to be a regular thing, I agree with you. It's It's... Yeah, it's a little tacky. <laughs> Other questions? Item two? The uh, item two, I, I know what it is, but I don't know all the details. It may be shown under the tab. Th this, too, is a standard request that we've had before. And Thomas it, Dorsey Festival? Yes, the, the Thomas Dorsey Festival is, has been in existence for many years now, and the city has always supported that event, and it essentially, in the beginning, was a semi-city event. And I think that the reason that this is in here is simply to follow the new policy that's been created so that you actually document what type of contribution the city is actually making to an event that's within the uh, within the city. Uh, my only question would be: It was four thousand dollars allocated last year, wasn't it? Well, it used to be in the budget. Now it's under that grant application where we've set aside fifteen thousand dollars, and you have to apply for it, and then you have to stipulate 
the items you need, how much they're co going to cost, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so they're putting forth an application just like Taste of Villa Rica is going to do, and just like we just approved for the arts, uh, the art art festival. Art festival. Um, <coughs> my my only thing, and I have no problem with approving it, is I just keep looking at how much everybody's paying for sound systems every time. How much of it is the cost for sound? I'd like to have us at some time look at that and see if there's a way we can reduce that cost. If I recall, for just this particular one, four thousand dollars. It's four thousand dollars just for the sound system, and so I don't know. I don't know. I I just think every time we're having an event, it ching ching. I noticed the request was 95.5, and the staff recommended 8,025. Um, I was just going to mention, because I heard, yes, it was in the budget, we did have a line item set aside for 4,000 that we would give them the check, and that was to cover the fireworks, but it was, and y'all have already discussed it, but it was also in the budget um, for the sound as part of the Parks and Rec um, budget, so that's why... Um, I didn't want it to get lost that we only gave them 4000 That's all we gave them in check form, but like it was mentioned, that was part of our budget as far as sound and lighting. And all so that. there's a combination. Part of it's the grant, part of it's what was in the budget? Right. So this is our first year. Um, you know, maybe With our community grant, grant pool yeah. will be bigger next year because, like you said, we're seeing how much everything costs. And I think that's what we were trying to get to, to see how much we really were giving to these community groups. Um, well, we put fifteen thousand dollars aside for that. This we just approved one last month. Uh, this one staff is recommending eight thousand. Right. And then there's another one when I turn the page. Taste of Villa Rica. Yeah. Uh, Four thousand. And we used up to fifteen. That's twelve thousand there. And then the arts. What did they apply for? I want to say there was it was about fourteen hundred. Th and those were the big three, the three big ones that we have ha helped in the past. Um, those are probably the most expensive. And if you want to add anything to that, um, so I know that does cover the ones we've at least helped in the past, except for Taste of Villarica, right? That's the last big one that we've helped in the past. And We're at about thirteen four, roughly. We don't have much left. Now, well, and notice, Taste of Villarica is October, so I think everybody, I was thinking, they looked and thought, we better get in on that now before the money's gone. But did. just a point about the tents. Now, the tents, we already own them, you know, so, yeah, they get a little wear and tear. We're not going out and buying tents for everybody. The but we art, them up. Yeah, the, there you go. The art, um, they wanted everything to look uniform according to Chris, but if we wanted to stretch this money, I mean, I've been to art shows all over the country, haven't you, arts and crafts? Most of the time, those people bring their own tents and set them up. So if we want to stretch the money, we'll have to consider the arts and crafts people need to come and set their tent up with their little weight things for the storms and everything else. We could, we could stretch the money that way because our people wouldn't be getting paid hourly to do all that. But if I remember correctly, Sarah, at the beginning of the year, we notified all of these groups and let them know what we're doing and told them they need to go and get their applications in. So. Yes. Other questions? Tabby? Arts and Recreation? This is a request um, regarding the Tri Music Festival hosted by the Stepping Stones Foundation. They're uh, requesting to serve beer and wine at their fundraising musical festival at the Mill Amphitheater. Um, this will be the second year that uh, this request was held. Um, I know the applicant is here. So um, similar to last year, uh, they have been notified that they would, again, have to work with an approved uh, caterer with a s serving license as well. So I'll let the applicant uh, come before you. Mr. Mayor, we skipped uh, community development. Yeah. Do you want to do that now? or? Well, that was pointed out to Mr. Lyons, the learned councilman to my left. So <laughs> <laughs> we don't like the Lions Club, well. Like <laughs> I, I love the Lions Club <laughs> and what they do. So, right. Vicky, if you would st stand aside for just a second, we will uh, uh, cover my mistake and, and, and cover this last one, the community Devel development grant application for Golden City Lions Club. And who's going to 
handle that one? Uh, I, I can introduce it, which is <coughs> uh, th this too is an event that has been put on in the city for four or five years now. Uh, it's sponsored by both the uh, Lions Club and the Golden City Lions Club. I mean, you're familiar with what the taste of Villarica is. It does bring in a large number of people into the city. And the, the amount requested is just shown on the next page. Thank you, David. Any questions? Okay. Now, let's move on to tab E. Vicki, sorry about that. Do you want me to reintroduce again, or would you just like to add a few? <laughs> would you please? <laughs> okay. I'll pass them out. This is Dry Music Festival. I guess they didn't find any though. Was the Carolina possums in there? I didn't see that one, but they mentioned a few other types of bats. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here, uh, my name is Dwayne Moore, and I'm representing the Stepping Stone Foundation of Douglasville. And uh, I'm here really to talk a little bit about us having our fifth annual Tri Music Festival back here at the Mill. This will be our second year having it at the Mill. We partnered with the city last year, and um, we had a successful event. And uh, the event is uh, to raise scholarship funds for five college-bound students, you know, within the uh, service area of Douglasville, Lithia Springs, Villa Rica, and the Carrollton area. And so what I'm here today is uh, requesting permission to serve beer and wine, you know, by an approved uh, city vendor. Last year we worked with the Olive Tree. Now in regards to a couple details, uh, we're going to continue coordinating with the recs and rec department and office for, for our facility details and the local police. We'd like to have uh, two to three food trucks or vendors uh, providing food and snacks. Uh, we're gonna pr provide our own PA and lighting. Um, we will be um, barricading off or, or roping off the area for our ticketed guests. You know, all our, our guests will have uh, wristbands. Um, last year we had about 200 to 250. We're expecting about 300. Uh, Three or four hundred probably this year, and the concert is going to be between five and nine p.m. <coughs> and uh, we're looking forward to another successful event. Now, uh, within the last couple of weeks, I spoke with uh, Sergeant Efridge in to kind of go over what occurred last year, and uh, you know things that we might be able to do differently. And he said everything went great; there was no problems. And so uh, we want to continue the partnership with uh, the city. You say you support five college-bound students? Yes. And how do you choose your college-bound students? Well, we go to all the local schools, and they write essays. And then there's a, our scholarship committee will pick from those essays. How many scholarships did you award last year? Uh, five last year. We've done up to about, uh, we've, we've done 13,000 thus far in scholarships, but we do five a year. How many of those were from Villarica? Last year, I don't think there were any from Villarica. Oh. No, there weren't. <laughs> See, I, I think what we're, having, we're having a problem when we, we go to the schools, we're not getting enough applicants, so mm -hmm. we got to do a better job of getting the applicants. You, know. <coughs> you can't win if you don't write the right. essay. I, I can Nobody understand did. that because, you know, we've got other things that do the, do the um, essays, and like you said, just 
You just gotta write a, you know, the essay and uh, the Dorsey yeah. Foundation, uh-huh. and we just we're not getting you know. The, if I could set up a meeting with you, I think we got an inside of the school system that okay. way. <laughs> oh, I, I would uh, love to meet with you on that. When is the deadline for the uh, essays? Oh, it, it's uh, God, in, we got a few more months. We got a few more, but I'll, I'll meet with you and I'll make sure you get that information. I, I am all for any way that we can get children into college, period. Uh, I've spent the better part of my life working with young, young people so i'm all for this but but i would hope that we to the extent that we can that we work with uh Billerica high school in the in the high school so we can get a scholarship here i'm not putting any pressure on you i'm just telling no, you uh, we would love for for Billerica to be a part of that no this is our service area and yeah, so but you uh, know, i'm glad you come to our community because you know what that's people douglasville coming downtown that's right Villarica, looking at what restaurants might be here and uh, everything went smoothly last year. I think we even saw pictures afterwards and everything. So uh, I'm glad y'all are coming again. I hope you have good weather like last year. It was good last year. Well, it was a little rain at first. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Now, is this just for high school? Uh, if you've already got into college, you, you can't apply. That, that's for high school. This is uh, for okay. people graduating. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. Mr. Mayor, I would like to echo what he said about Sergeant Etheridge said that everything went smooth, that they were completely professional on everything, and it was done beautifully. They handled everything. Uh, our guys were just there, and they did all the work. It was pretty nice. We appreciate them. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Item two. What did you have before you? These are the um, gold dust gymnasium roof replacement bids. Uh, the city put out um, bids for the roof replacement. Um, at the end of 2015, we did an assessment of several of the roofs around the city with our facilities. Um, what was we had this particular roof for gold dust set aside in the budget for this year for replacement. We worked uh, closely with the Garland Group that worked with really kind of pre-qualifying, developing our scope of services of what would go out to bid. Um, we received three bids back. What you have in your packet is the bid tabulation. And what staff is recommending um, is approval to work with the Garland Group with the final selection of Ben Hill Roofing. Uh, the lowest bid came back at $266,155. Um, we have a representative here, um, Mr. Britt Gresham, uh, that may be able to answer any additional questions that you may have uh, specifically related to uh, some of our bid uh, responses. But we work with them essentially with doing the pre-qualifying and also just evaluating uh, the final bid responses back to the city. I'll just tell you a horror story. I was talking to the gentleman from Garland Group when I started working with the uh, Parks and Recreation Department back in March of 2001. Uh, I was really impressed with the facility there at Goldust until it rained the first time. And uh, I came in one morning and there were about a dozen garbage cans down the hall uh, going to the gymnasium because the rain was just falling. So it, it is an ongoing problem with that flat roof uh, at the recreation center over there. Yeah, I would point out that the, the roof does have multiple sections, and this is the section that only applies to the gymnasium at this particular point. So, good point. Why don't they do flat roofs? This was the lowest bid? <coughs> that is correct. Well, you had three of them in here. And you had three bids. I see them in here. We budgeted for this in capital improvements. We budgeted for this. Um, the budgeted amount was 250000 so the lowest bid does uh, surpass that 250000 Okay. Questions? Okay. Item three, Connors Road. 
So for this item, you know, we just recently finished the planning of the park. Um, as we are beginning to move forward, what I wanted to do was really kind of touch base. Um, I think it's time that we really kind of come up with a more permanent name for the facility. Uh, Part of my discussion of when I asked, had there already been discussion? Uh, we certainly, as staff, had talked about uh, going through a naming process, but we wanted to really get some direction or hear some insight from the city council if there were maybe any names that you wanted to for us to consider, or if there was a process that uh, uh, you had in mind uh, as it relates to giving a permanent name for this particular park location. On I'd like to Earth. see us get the public involved and have a little contest and see what names they can come up with and see what we like. I think that's a good idea. Um, is the Recreation Advisory Committee involved in this? We haven't done anything yet. So okay. I, before I go to the public, I always kind of want to hear uh, you as a city council weigh in. I didn't know if there were any names that had already been thought about or discussed before we go to the public. I think we can I do a naming. About uh, a name. We've just <laughs> been trying to figure out how to get that part going. Right. You, you know, it, it, certainly you can do a naming process, and then if you want the um, Recreation Advisory Committee to consider kind of whittle it down to maybe four or five names and then maybe bringing it to you guys to make a final determination. I think that's probably the easiest thing uh, to do. Yeah, I'd just like to see them involved because they're not actually the public. They're the people we've appointed to be advisors kind of with you and with us. So I definitely want to see their hand on it. And I'd, I'd definitely like to see the list of names that the public sends in. Are we going to have an idea of where they headed? Okay. Well, I want the advisory committee involved, but I, I want to see the broader public be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, it's their part. Or they could come up with the idea of how to reach out to the public, something like that. Uh, it's also. I want to see the public. It's a good advertisement to the public. They'll know it's there and get them involved. Okay. You know, about three years ago, the high school put a new gymnasium up. And as in the past, there's all, always been names for athletic places. And there were 12 or 15 of them. Pretty pop prominent people of the city of Villarica got together. And it still is a new high school gym. <laughs> <laughs> and quite frankly, what was said was they choose not to do a naming of it until maybe, just maybe, somebody will come along with a substantial amount of money to put into it. Now, I'm not saying that's, that's what, what needs to take takes place here, but it's a thought. Well, in that case, we'd have to call it the Douglas County Taxpayer Splost <laughs> Park because they, <laughs> they provided the money for the park. Well, but so. not, well, you know, I'm talking about future money, not, pavilion. <laughs> not money that's already been available. I'm talking about future money for things that would go in. Uh, uh, for instance, a Southwire Park or Walmart Park or some, you know, it doesn't matter who. It matters that they're giving substantial amounts of money. But that's just a thought. It's not something that... Well, I'm sure you're thinking about sponsors and things for pavilions and other stuff like that. I don't think his microphone's on. It never hurts. I mean, downtown we've done that with benches, you know, accessories. And, you know, could name the dog park after somebody. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I like the idea of, of the public absolutely needs to be involved in the, in the naming process, but definitely, you know, the Recreation Advisory Commission needs to be involved in that. That would be my desire. Yeah, no, we have figured out how we have vacancies. If anybody's interested in being on that advisory oh, committee, that's right. Sorry, I never have figured out how we came up with the name for the v -plex. Know. What was that? <laughs> the <V> Excuse me. <laughs> Actually, it is the Villarica Recreation and Sports Complex, the Villarica Civic Center and Sports Complex, and we couldn't get all that on the jerseys, so we went to, to, to V Plex, <laughs> to VR Plex, but to V Plex. It's okay. cheaper <laughs> to make the signs. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion on that item? I think we've talked about that one. Uh, item four. Velcro pygmies, and these are not people. Well, actually, they are people. They are people. <laughs> they are people. Well, I mean, it's not a group of people. But so, for our uh, kickoff of, for our summer concert series, 
Um, Saturday, June 10th, uh, we have the Velcro Pygmy scheduled. What we have before you today is a request to serve beer and wine um, through an approved uh, city uh, caterer uh, with a pouring license. Uh, last year we used the uh, olive tree. We didn't have any challenges or issues as it related to the event outside of Mother Nature, but um, we did, this would be our second year um, with the request for beer and wine to be served at the event. This is the one that got rained out last year? That is correct. Okay. You know the question. Do we have rain insurance on this event or do we have a backup plan if it rains to have a makeup date? We have rain insurance for this event uh, as it relates to backup dates they it would again same thing it would just be coming up with a second date um, and kind of doing it all over again should anything happen or occur as it relates to we just need to know that that there is a right. game plan for that yeah. because of last year and I brought this up when we talked about it last month mm -hmm. uh, do you have a plan in place yet for the uh, for the tables and chairs that folks will be paying for you talked about then that you might be looking at a different process and then you would bring it back to us are we there yet or is this a little premature we're no we're still working on it and part of it again is is how we're going to add value one of the things that we looked at was just selling the table as a whole but also when you're selling the table what is that experience going to be the what makes the Velcro pygmies a little bit different. They all, we have a step and repeat that was kind of really already set up. So they were kind of already engaging the community the same way. We're really just trying to still finalize what that is going to be to enhance the experience of those who may purchase a table. Um, in years past, what we were doing is just selling the chairs individually. Um, so depending on the group that we have we're still kind of working on what that's going to look like is that going to be you know a uh, backstage experience where you can go back to what we call our green room and interact with the artists um that's what we're still working through so you're still working on some of that okay. correct but the rain insurance will cover refunds for the people that buy the tables and they get washed away well, it's really the makeup date of, of what that'll be I had I almost forgotten about that, but then when I was reading through the minutes, because I, I was going to ask you about the rain insurance, and then I, I'm reading the minutes go, I think it's $400. I asked you if you were comfortable with what, how it protects us, because I know it has limitations and all. It does, uh, um, and I think, not to get away from this, but it's something that we need to look at for some, of, particularly for our, even our larger events like our, our July 3rd, but I think that should be the better, because we do spend so much more yeah. uh, on, on those events, Thank and you. I know the city certainly had a rain out recently. I appreciate you looking at options. I, just for my thoughts, I think that the chairs probably would be something that would be better for... The chairs be versus the table? Of, well, both. The way it was done last year. I don't know with as many people as we're out there, I'd like to see a lot of people loading up chairs and walking across the whole. I know a lot of people will bring chairs, but just just think about it when you the, the big The big problem, as I remember, <coughs> Councilman McDougall, was that if, if somebody bought a table or a ch <coughs> one of the chairs for the first event that got rained out, then they were asked to pay again the second time around. And that's probably the one issue is that we need to settle is that if you buy a table and it gets rained out if there's a makeup you can get that ta same table without having to pay again cool. that was the complaints that we it received that is, that is a big complaint too a valid complaint i just have one other concern with this and i may be the only one i don't mind if we have beer and wine sales occasionally at events downtown I don't want to see our whole summer series turn into beer and wine sales. Now, I may be the only one, but I don't want all our events being beer and wine downtown. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Vicki. Tab F, governing body. Item 1. I don't know who's in charge of that, but um, I think this is this is. 
Okay. <laughs> now, Elisa, if you, if you know more about it, I, I think this is a repeat event also, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, this is an easy one, too. Yeah, this is simple. Please state your name and... <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, my name is Bird Best. <laughs> teacher at the high school. Uh, this is their 28th annual event. Uh, they've been having the event at the Mill Amphitheater ever since the Mill opened. And all they're asking for is the use of the Mill Amphitheater, the keys to the concession stand and the restroom. They bring all their table and chairs. They don't need the sound and lighting. All they want is the use of the amphitheater. It is on um, Easter Sunday morning. It's a sunrise service. Like I said, this has been an annual event for 28 years here. So they're not asking for anything else but just the use of the mill. And it's from Jonesman Funeral Home and Meadowbrook Memory Gardens. And they put it on for the community. Yes, it's a it's community. It's not like they're event. having some kind of fundraiser. This right. is put on for the community. Right, yes. this is an easy one. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Alyssa. I see a $300. Is there a $300 fee involved here? If you had to rent it, it would be, and this is basically <coughs> our agreement with them that they're not going to be charged because they're okay. putting on So they're asking us to waive the fee. This is right. so we can keep up with what it's costing. It's the formality, yeah. Okay, item two, meeting minutes. We will have those meeting minutes on, on the Tuesday meeting. Okay. Item three, Villarica Development Authority. And this is to fill the, the expired terms for Todd, is it Anduzi? Andus? Yeah, the time was right out, yeah. yeah um, All of these folks want to be reappointed? I don't, I will be, yeah. That's what the community the authority is going to recommend. Okay. Okay. Any the questions? They're attending the meeting, so. Okay, and then item four, charter changes. I can introduce that one. <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> uh, yes, I just wanted to add in that at the meeting on Tuesday, it will come before you that uh, for consideration of an amendment to the city charter pursuant to the home rule provisions, uh, we brought it up at the last meeting. Uh, there will also be brought up at this meeting. There'll be an opportunity for the public to speak concerning the uh, the change. Uh, it has been properly published in the le the legal notices. Uh, in the, the charter changes to remove section 3.23 and 3.24, which deals with the grounds for removal and procedure of remo for removal of the city manager. You say to delete those two sections? Correct. Okay. Be because there is another section in there that conflicts with those two sections. And our practice over the last years has, has been to enter into a contract with the city manager that uh, provides the terms of their removal. Okay. We have read. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was just going to introduce one thing. Not too long. Um, although I probably will get this on the agenda for last time, but I know we don't have to have it on the agenda just to throw something out briefly at the work session. The lovely concrete building that is at our entryway coming into town, Ryan Clark uh, owned it putting around, that has now been turned down for a third business wanting to open there. And I'm not saying they might have, some might have been rightly turned down. It's coming down to this matrix that's on the downtown overlay and I think we can possibly work with what somebody's wanting to put in there right now I think we need to be willing to but the problem is they're showing up at City Hall and they're being told no off the bat and they think that's the end of it they don't realize that no isn't necessarily no there they can come talk to us planning and zoning that sort of thing and we might be able this might be something we want there but I'll, I'll make sure it's on the agenda but just know there are there is a business that wants to do something with that building and fix it up and we'll have to decide if it's appropriate and works and that's a good point but I, I do believe I've seen a process flow chart that basically lays out what the steps are is there is a process flow chart, but I would say that 
for the issue that you're bringing up, it would actually require um, an amendment to the zoning ordinance in order for somebody to be able to come for consideration to whether it ends up being conditional use or um, I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm, what it's zoned mm -hmm. and what it provides for, but it would require the zoning amendment and then going through the process of making the application because they may be approved as of right or have to go through an additional step through conditional use process. That's fine. My concern is if they're coming in and all they're hearing is no and not that there's a process, I want to make sure we're business friendly and that if there's another avenue that these people should know what it is. That's Sounds not your like fault. I'm Sounds just like Vicky's not really saying that there is another avenue. That's sort of a that's a larger step when you talk about changing the ordinance, right? Right. You're not talking about a variance. Right. You can't do a you can't vary use. Mm -hmm. That it only can go through the ordinance being changed. And again, it's whatever the wider implications of that change are going to be. But if it is then changed to allow the use to exist, then it may potentially have to go through another process, whether it's conditional use or it could just be allowed as a right based upon well i'm somewhat change. familiar with with uh, what councilwoman mcpherson's talking about and david i think maybe we should look at that ordinance uh and maybe make that part of a procedure where we can take a look at it if we need to i don't know exact i, I know some of the businesses you're talking about maybe they would pass maybe they wouldn't but maybe we could look at that i think the council should always have an option Cl uh, clearly you do and, and one of the things you know, the, this ordinance was written back seven, eight years ago. Probably periodically we ought to ask the council, the planning commission to review it as a whole because there may be businesses that exist now that didn't exist back when this list was created and, and we may just need to revamp the whole thing. Like video rental stores is probably on there somewhere and we're not going to have many <laughs> requests for that. <laughs> I, I uh, think that'd be... Planning and zoning actually was working their way through this. Were y'all not back when Janet was here? Weren't y'all kind of through the UDC, John? Not, not very aggressive, but you talked about it. Parts here and there, because that would be great if we could get that updated, because there's, there's a blank spot where this might be allowed. And just a comparison is we have uh, uncorked downtown because we worked on something that would work for us without having a full-fledged bar, but we did want the type of business like uncork so sometimes we just got to look at it and tweak it but anyway thank you remember we don't have bars downtown <laughs> that's what i'm saying we but we have we have a uh, wine and craft beer boutique there you go <laughs> 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 limited hours no hard liquor you know it's got we crafted it in a sense we have bar and grill i, I just bars. don't want us uh, to your larger point i just don't want us turning away business especially when we've got a vacant building sitting up there. So Since 1999. I understand. And more importantly, we have an eyesore in the city of Illerica that, that we need to address. Since so I think we do need to look at that. Get the eyesore stuff before that building. <laughs> you know, when you come around the curb, they come under that breeze. That's a big eyesore city right yeah. there. Yep, it really is. Okay, we have reached that uh, moment in our uh, work session when we consider what items will be placed on the agenda. Just for the public that may not be aware, uh, the items that we discussed today, uh, those items that do not require further discussion that the council feels like we don't need to discuss Tuesday night will be placed on a consent agenda, which will be voted on, or the council will have a chance to vote on that consent agenda Tuesday night. Uh, they also have the option to remove any item uh, off of that consent agenda prior to the vote, and, uh, and then that w item will be discussed. So I'd just like to always kind of explain that to our public and those watching us. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, tab A, all three of those items, of course, will mm -hmm. not be on the consent agenda. Uh, tab B, one, what is your desire? Yes, we can consent agenda. Yes. It's budgeted and everything, right? I say yes. Consent yes. agenda. Does anybody say no? Okay. Consent agenda it is. Okay, tab C. Uh, of course, Sarah will be here giving us the update so the public will know. Uh, I don't believe there are any items on there that will be consent agenda. Okay, tab D. David, what, what's your opinion on that? About the budget amendment. Jazz Fest. Uh, the, the Jazz Festival, uh, since it does deal with an alcohol license agreement, I think you probably ought to vote on that separately. Okay. 
And Councilman McDougal just brought up a good point. Do we need to vote on tab C, or do we need to at least make that an agenda item, tab C item 2, two which is a 2016 budget amendment? To me, I think that I think that needs to definitely be discussed. A it, it, uh, budget amendment does need to be discussed. It should not be lump, okay. lumped into the uh, consent agenda. Okay. What did he say about the D items? We have to vote on all those grant applications, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. We do. Some of them involve the alcohol. 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 What about the roof? <laughs> the roof is budgeted. Oh, don't get ahead of me now. Oh, sorry. Tab, <laughs> tab E. <laughs> uh, item 1, the festival. Vote. Um, Vote. Big yeah. Griffin beer. Yeah, right. and Chris wasn't here to present it either. You can skip those beer and Item two, the gold dust gymnasium roof replacement bids. That's the low bid, and it's over the budget, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to vote on the bid, that's right. Don't we? We have to vote. vote. Yeah. yeah, we have okay. to, so... Well, this is an increase, too. Okay, uh, Connors Road Park. Um, we need to discuss that. Velcro Pygmy Summer Concert, we had to discuss that. So we don't have many items on the consent agenda. <laughs> we have one. Like <laughs> one. What's the point of having a consent agenda? <laughs> one item. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, I would entertain a motion to adjourn the work session. You don't need it. We don't it's just have to work. Right, because we're not oh, that's right. We don't have to do that. So. Mr. Mayor, we do have some people present who I understand want to speak. And I just want to make the point to them that we're going to go immediately from this meeting into another meeting, and that second meeting does provide for public comment. So, so you'll get a chance to have your say. Will these people be here? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, we'll, be we'll stay around. We will stay here, sir. So we go right into a call meeting. Yes, Okay, I will call this meeting, the special call mayor and council meeting for March 30th, 2017. And call this meeting to an order. Uh, you have had a chance to look at the agenda. Are there any changes in the agenda as printed? Hearing none, we will move into the public comment portion of this meeting. Move to adopt the agenda. I'm sorry. Second. We have a move and a second to adopt the agenda as presented. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Now, we move into the public comment section of the meeting. If you want to offer your public comments, please come forward and do so. Uh, I would ask that you sign in at the lectern and please state your name and address for the record. And please limit your comments to three minutes. When mayor on Tuesday, we try to use that new format. If there's a lot of people to speak, they can sign in ahead of time or pass it down, pass it down the chairs. Yeah, and I think that would be a good idea. Where, where's the lease? I, Tuesday I know we'll, might have, be, a, we'll have a we'll have a packed house Tuesday busy. night. Okay. Might be real busy. <laughs> my name is Charles Cole, and this is my wife, Vaughn, over here. We own the property that was in the first uh, rezoning item that you had today. And I want to invite any of you that would like to come see this property. I will take you. I have a four-wheel drive, and we'll be glad to take you. Uh, Mr. Best had been on the trip with me before. And did I ever take you, Ms. Marchman? I, don't, I didn't remember. But if you'd like to go, uh, be glad to take you any time and let you see what you are looking at and show you all the... Uh, buffer strips and everything involved in it and I think you'll be impressed when you see the property and thank you so much thank you sir any further public comments Good evening, Jeff 
Mayor Reese and City Council. Please, if you would state your name and record. Okay, my, name is, uh, record. my name is Tim Miles. <clears throat> I am the owner and operator of Pop Audio. I had not planned on speaking today, but due to the concerns that were brought up in the previous meeting, I felt like it was timely and pertinent to address some of the questions that Ms. McPherson and others may have regarding cost and of sound and lighting and things like that. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served uh, as a contractor for the city of Villarica over the past six years. Uh, and I also have another comment regarding the uh, property that is being considered for rezoning that Ms. Coleman brought up. Uh, I actually live over off of South Van Wert Road and can give you a little information. That on the northern end of that particular property, it is subject to wet weather issues. There are some flooding issues that take place right there at Church Street or Church Road. So in your consideration of your sewage, you may want to look at that because when it rains really hard, both on the uh, east side and the west side of that particular property at Church Street, it does flood. So from a sewage perspective, that's a normal observation. But, and I would be more than glad to answer any direct questions. You mentioned the costs on sound and lighting. I don't know at what depth you're familiar with the pricing of which Pop Audio has contracted. I know you've approved it as a whole. I know I've worked with uh, Ms. Marchman and some of the others, but in the past, uh, the needs and the desires of the directors of the project, meaning the mill, have continued to ask for improved <coughs> upgrades in lighting, sound, because when Ms. Stovall was handling the mill, it was a growth opportunity. Her vision was to move it towards a, you might say, a little Chastain type park thing. And as that's gone on, it's required more expenditures, more investments, and a higher level of equipment and personnel to provide the level of sound and lighting that you have experienced in the recent years. Now, that being said, I don't know if you're aware, but in the contracts that I've offered over the years, if the city books as a group of shows, I think we had it last year, correct me if I'm wrong, Vicki, it's six or more. Six more, and more or 10 or more shows as a book of work. I have been giving the city a 33% discount below market value. So in reference to your question about $4,000, <coughs> for the Thomas Dorsey Festival, the payrolls just for the help for one day exceeds $1,000. And that is to, con to get qualified help that can make the equipment do what it needs to do to provide the level of quality that the community has grown to want and appreciate. So if you do your math there, that's two days. I do not charge rental on the equipment for the second day. I provide that for free. And, th that, and in the lighting, the city has yet to pay anywhere near the required cost to have that level of lighting. Now, and I think Ms. Coleman could qualify this statement. We have just ended a bidding process to bid on two shows for the city, the July 3rd show and the awards banquet of which most of you participated in. The bids came in. I was low bid. It was $4,500 for the July 3rd show, and it was 1050 for the awards banquet. The closest bid, and we had four companies to bid on that, the closest bid was a 9000 and some change. Wow. The next one up was around 18000 and the high bid was over 25000 for the same services and same specs that were given out for me to bid on. So my point is, from the city's perspective, it's not only prudent to utilize, and of course I have a, a biased opinion being a local vendor, mm -hmm. it's not only prudent to keep the money in the community, but the discounts that the city is receiving, even at those prices, is well worth the consideration. And, you know, you can, uh, Vicki can qualify the statement about the bids. What you may get into is it may cost you more in the end depending on your specifications. And everybody, you know, from a, from a local community perspective should really understand that Villarica's productions, in my opinion, 
and from the general public exceed what you see in Carrollton at the AMP. Because I've worked at the AMP, I've worked at the... Shh, don't tell them. Oh, don't tell them. <laughs> I've worked at the AMP, I've worked in Douglasville at O'Neill Plaza and done that. I've worked in Chastain Park and done... Uh, not Chastain, but in uh, Piedmont Park. We've done the city, uh, the food truck festivals. We worked in multiple larger areas. And what you're getting, because you have such a great venue, and I give kudos to the mayor back when he was a Parks and Rec director, uh, you have a fantastic venue. It's not perfect yet, but it is, it, it's got such a great footprint to build on. And some of these other things that have happened, uh, you know, different vendors. I remember the, when Peachtree Entertainment came in, and I actually have some friends in Sound and Lighting in northern Georgia, and I understand the prices. The prices you've been getting have been based off of a 5% return on investment on my end. When we show up over here at the mill, we're bringing approximately $80,000 worth of equipment plus help. So I just wanted you to understand, I've never had this opportunity and I felt like it was prudent for understanding mm -hmm. information purposes. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, where you, you know, it's, you know, do you want to shop Louis Vuitton or Walmart? You know, it, it's really up to the city as to the quality of presentations y'all want to do. And we're working off of the specifications that were derived from the visions of the city employees that were in charge of things at the time. So I hope I hadn't gone over my three minutes, but I'm here. Actually, you know, I'm here as a technical consultant today to get it where everybody in the audience could hear, you know, y'all and bring in the microphones. But uh, I like working with y'all, and I hope to continue to. And I'm here as a resource locally. You know, because I do live in the community. I'm not in the city, but I live off of uh, Oak and Oak Walk down off of South Van Wert Road, right below where the property is being rezoned. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Appreciate that. Thank you, Tim. Mm I must need a rubber stamp here. Mm -hmm. um, I really had not intended to speak today, but um, since it is public comments, and I do want to make some comments regarding the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting last Tuesday. Um, did not have an opportunity to do that earlier, but um, you can expect some significant turnout, I suspect, on Tuesday. This room was filled. Tuesday. Planning and zoning, if we have one or two attendees, it's an overwhelming response. Uh, we walked into that meeting and there, there were at least, I, I didn't count them, but there were at least 50, maybe 60 people here. Um, and they were all community comments made regarding the two proposals that Vicki discussed. Um, we in the Planning and Zoning Commission, since that meeting, have been inferred as incompetent because of the action that we took. I resent that. Um, nonetheless, that comment was made because we did not approve the, the rezoning. The material that you saw on this chart was not made available to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, there was some discussion, but we didn't see it before until the meeting about the subdivision of that property. Uh, when asked of Mr. Dickinson uh, what his intentions were, he had none. Um, so we have no idea what the intentions are of that of that property. Um, on on the property being developed uh, on Van Wert, uh, again, um, a great deal of controversy about that. Uh, in asking uh, Mr. I believe his name is Hunt. Uh, Christopher Hunt, um, he plans to develop 24 homes on that 10 acres, but there is a great deal of those 10 acres that are provisioned for public use. I mean, it's nice. There'll be walking trails and parks and, and whatever, but those lots, 
he will build those homes on 6,000 square foot lots. That's a pretty small lot. Now, the other part of it is taken up with this community septic system, whatever the heck that is. Um, and he talks in a very confusing matter about black water and gray water and white water, and uh, you, you need to, to probe this. But uh, when asked about the price of those homes, he envisioned selling those homes for $300,000 on a 6,000-foot lot. Uh, those are not houses. Those are apartments. Um, so you need to question these. But, um, you know, the community will come out, and you'll hear a lot of them. There was nobody on either side of the community that was in favor of either of these two proposals. So you'll, you'll get a great deal of response. My concern, though, is the group regarding the, uh, the development of that property, uh, they will, that, that's public hearing, so they can speak. My concern is the other group that will not be public hearing. And so unless they, unless you open it up to allow them to speak, uh, they will not have the opportunity to present their concerns. But, um, uh, you know, listen, yeah. listen to, to planning and zoning. We, we, we're, we feel pretty useless in many respects, uh, but not incompetent, as was, has been suggested. Um, so thank you for your time. Anybody else? Seeing none, we'll move on to tab A, which is action on the interim city manager. Mr. Mayor, uh, that, that particular action, as, as you're all aware, we, uh, our interim city manager resigned on Tuesday morning, and temporarily, Chief Mansour is sitting in as our interim city manager. That has not been approved by the council, and uh, I thought it was appropriate to have formal council approval of the chief acting as the interim city manager. Um, now, with re regard to the, the terms and details of that, we may, we, may, we may need to talk about some of that in executive session, but if you were going to ask him to serve in that capacity, then uh, it would be appropriate to, for you all to consider that and discuss it now. I'd like to make a motion that uh, we appoint um, Chief Mansour as our acting city manager until we hire our permanent city manager. Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? My if not... My is I still think if we don't use him that we ought to compensate him for it. Well, we have an executive session. This goes on. Is, is that something we would discuss? We have an executive yeah. session. Uh, we yeah, have an executive good. session to discuss we, those types of items. Okay. I see. We have a motion and a second to approve uh, his appointing as the interim city manager I have a, uh, and a second. So I'll, without further discussion, I'll call the question. All in favor? It is unanimous. As long as he said yes, I wanted to make sure you said yes. <laughs> You're sitting there. I guess you have it. I think we, if he wasn't sitting up here, that would be a pretty good indication that <laughs> he was in favor of it. You might have to get him a different chair, though. Okay, tab uh, item B, hiring process for the city manager. All right, Mr. Mayor, on that particular item, <clears throat> it seemed to me, it occurred to me that sort of the elephant in the room right now is what is our process, and we need to get that out on the table for the public so that there's no misunderstanding about what the process will is. And part of that is for your discussion here, but I, I want to at least share with you, I have had conversation with our, uh, with Stephanie Rooks, our Human Resources Director, and, and we at least have a proposed plan to you for the hiring process, uh, subject to your consideration, changes, suggestions. Uh, the position has been advertised. It's been advertised in numerous publications. The, the uh, credentials and qualifications and job duties have all been advertised. That, that people have been made aware of that. My understanding is that we've received in somewhere around 130 different applications at this point in time. The, the process that we are at least recommending that we go through for consideration uh, is uh, 
Stephanie has been able, or Ms. Rooks has been able to separate the, uh, the applications in essentially three groups thus far. One, if you recall on the, uh, the job description, we advertise that prior manager, city managerial experience is highly desired. Uh, so really our tier one candidates are those persons who have applied who have prior city or county managerial experience that have actually served in the capacity as a city or county manager. That's what we consider to be our tier one candidates. There's roughly 14 to 15, I, I believe, of, of those candidates. The next tier of candidates that we have are people who meet the, the uh, requirements or that they have had some previous experience working with a city or a county in, a, in some type of managerial capacity, for example, as the road superintendent or the finance director or the, plant, the community development director, those types of positions where they have had a position of authority with a local government, but perhaps not uh, being formally a manager of the entire city or county. Those are the people that we would consider to be second tier candidates. And then we have a number of people who have applied that don't meet any of the, don't meet any of the hiring criteria. And we've had that happen before, people that have just decided that they wanted to go from driving a taxi to running a city, which is fine to have goals like that, but uh, they don't meet our job criteria that we have posted. Uh, and, and we would consider those people to be our third tier candidates. Uh, as a process for going forward, at least our recommendation, and Ms. Rooks, if I misstate this, you, you jump up and correct me, but uh, our, our process, we believe, would be to uh, look at the tier one candidates who have the pre previous experience <coughs> uh, to, to have the council evaluate those people. We would intend at this point to ask all of those to come in to interview uh, unless there is some, you know, based on your review, there's some criteria related directly to the job qualifications that you say, no, we don't, we're not going to interview that person. If, if someone, you know, through, uh, has sent in a resume and, and we realize that they've been convicted of a felony or something, we would not want to interview them. Uh, but we would plan to interview those Tier 1 candidates. We would send a letter to the Tier 2 candidates telling them that um, we, are interview we are lining up interviews with other people initially, but that uh, we, if they are still interested, if we don't hire any of the Tier 1 candidates, that they will notify them that we're going to go review the Tier 2 candidates. And then we would also notify the Tier 3 candidates that they don't meet the qualifications that were advertised, and we thank them very much for applying, but we don't anticipate interviewing them. And just to do that immediately up front. Um, Villarica is an equal employment opportunity uh, employer, and we intend to ensure that anybody that we hire is based strictly on the qualifications that we have posted, uh, and then how they interview with the council. So that would be our suggested process. Um, I'd open that up for discussion and suggestions. Um, I, th I think we're prepared to uh, provide the Tier 1 and Tier 2 candidate resumes for you to be looking at, but I've outlined sort, sort of how we would go from, the, from here. Okay. Thank you for that explanation, David. Uh, I just want to clarify, this envelope that we were provided today has those Tier 1 uh, candidates in that. Is that correct, Stephanie? Does it also include the Tier 2 or just Tier 1? identifies a, a, a summary of their qualifications with their their uh, degrees whether they have previous city manager experience and how much and then the total number of years in uh, local or county government okay. my next question is uh, how would you perceive that we've moved forward as far as setting up the times for the interviews and keeping this completely transparent 
Um, you give me dates that fit into your schedules, and I will contact the applicants. Uh, and keep us legal. Um, how would that need to take place? You have the opportunity to interview them in private uh, in an executive session. Uh, we are required. We are not required to disclose any of these can applicants' names yet. At the point in time when the city has selected three people that they are going to consider as the top three, then we do have to disclose their names. And those people uh, who are in the top three, we can go to them and say, you're in our top three, and we're getting ready to disclose your name, and uh, we're going to interview you, f you further before any type of decision has been made. And th those people can either say, no, I don't want to have my name disclosed because I'm working in a job now and, you know, even though I wanted to apply with you, I really don't want my name disclosed. Uh, and they can drop out and we can replace them. At, uh, but at the point we get three people who are interested in the job and want to be interviewed and don't mind being made public, we disclose those three names and there has to be a period of time after we've disclosed who they are before we can actually act on hiring somebody. And the purpose of that is really to float their names up in public view so that uh, if we have a great hue and cry, outcry from anybody, they have an opportunity to do that. Let me elaborate a little bit on my question. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is uh, to stay in compliance with the Georgia Open Records Act, how many council persons can interview candidates or candidate at a time? I, I, I would say that you, you need to have everybody present. I mean, it, 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 it needs to be an executive session and you need to have every, we, we, we don't need to, in this process to remain perfectly transparent, we don't need to be trying to set up individual meetings between the candidates and one or two people. I, I, have, a, I have a point and a question. Previously, uh, 14 interviews is a lot of interviews. It takes, took a while just to interview five people last time. What we did, the previous setups for city manager is each one of the six of us read the resumes, put, put a rank, ranked them one to 14, and then we got together and accumulated those rankings and picked out the five, five top vote getters. I think, um, we need to narrow it down a little bit because 14 interviews is going to take a while. I, I understand that. Is, that is a realistic concern because you are obviously volunteers and, and you're, you don't need to be spending all day every day uh, doing this. But given the circumstances of, of, of our situation, again, we want to work very hard to show people that we're doing this the right way. And, and I'm, I'm not opposed to there being some process of whittling down the pool, but the problem on, you know, five people voting on who their top five candidates are. Actually six people. Six, six people voting on who their top six candidates are is that there's no explanation and there's no apparent um, I hate to keep using the word transparency because I think that's really an overused word these days, but it's, it's tr the truth. We're not giving any type of explanation as to why it's, you know, if you're whittling it down to five, why it's those five as opposed to the other nine that aren't being considered. If we can come up with, uh, and, and I think it's a good idea for all of you to look at these tier one candidates and Perhaps after you've done that, if we have a uh, executive session meeting and there is a good stated reason based on the qualifications that you as a whole have decided to interview only five, but I want to be prepared at the end of this process to be able to articulate to the whole world why candidate number five was picked and candidate six was not and it needs to be directly tied into the, the qualifications of the job. And, and it may be, you know, Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so, you were not interviewed because you got convicted for bank fraud last year. That's I probably the chosen. I hope we've eliminated anybody that's a felon by now. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm just using that as an extreme example, but we need to be able to articulate the reason why one person as opposed to another was not 
uh, interviewed if that's what we choose to do. So, yeah, I think you ought to look over the packet tonight, and, and I would c caution you and urge you that those resumes that have been distributed to you are confidential, and under our city ethics policy, you're not to, to share those with anybody that, you know, as unfortunate as it may be, I'd say that's even your spouse. Uh, doesn't get the right to thumb through all of those. Um, it is important that we treat them as confidential. These people have sent them in believing that they are confidential and we need to treat them as such. Our city ethics policy requires us to do that. Um, so, so look at them. Uh, we may want to schedule an executive session at the end of the meeting on Tuesday to, to, to further discuss the hiring process or, or, or individuals that we're considering hiring. And you may choose to say, you know, we only want to interview this person, this person, this person, but be prepared to have a reason why we would not interview a, a specific person that can be tied into the job qualifications. I am only one person and do not have a vote, but I will tell you that it is my desire that our, since our human resource manager has given us a list of 16 14. 14. 14 names uh, in tier one, that it would be my desire that we would interview all 14 candidates uh, and not try to pick any group out. And uh, this council will vote on that at a you know appropriate time but that would be my desire i um i appreciate the process but i don't like the fact that we're not getting the tier two applicants i like the i know we want them to have city manager experience but sometimes people that are out there in the business world have experience that might be very valuable i want to i would like to see those too um i agree with you uh leslie and i appreciate that we do have tier one applicants. I haven't opened this. Uh, I too would like, to, even if you have them separated, I'd like to see the tier twos. Uh, I also think that it would be uh, not the worst idea if all of them were sent to the council, even if they don't open them. Um, but going forward, we've mm -hmm. kept this job open. We haven't closed it. And I think that every application that comes in should be sent to the to the council going forward yeah, we'll from the date you hand us these still packets. Open, right? You want, just to clarify, you want all 135 applications? I personally do not want all 135. <laughs> I'm not going to look at no 123. I think that, that you know, we, we set the criteria that we wanted, one with experience. We set that criteria some time ago. Right. And um, I'm willing to stick to that and go through the tier one to start with because those have experience. And we need someone that can hit the ground running. we got a lot going on in Villarica. I want, I do want tier two and also, and the other thing, I'm still concerned about our ability to do maybe some of the background checking. Is there still an openness here to use any other entity to help us with some of this background check and following up on um, um, references that are given, but references that aren't given? How can we do that? Any, I mean, do we want to do that for all 14 of the tier one, or do we want to? There's got to be some way we got to narrow it down, even after we've reviewed all these resumes. Yeah. Somehow we've got to narrow it down. Mayor Reese has asked that question: if if there is such an organization that can help screen candidates, and I'm sure that there are. I I, I don't know any off the top of my head, but we're going to try and. Uh, look into that issue to, to see if it, there is a company that does exactly like that. Somebody outside ourselves that is can uh, do the background checks and give us a report on it uh, because we, we may not have done the best job we, we could have in the past on that. Are we going to have a, an executive session? This is possible. Uh, I, th I think we are going to have an executive session that discusses a specific hiring, compensation, employment or appointment type issue, but we can't talk about this process itself oh. in executive okay. session that because that, that doesn't deal with hiring or firing of a specific individual. This is a right. process and just in general and as 
fair game for the public to know how we're doing it. Absolutely. And, and I think we need to come to some conclusion and move forward. So I don't know if we need a... Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, based on the discussion, we need somebody to make a motion as to what... You already gotten the Tier 1 candidates sent to you. If, if there's a desire to have more of it, the Tier 2 or everybody, somebody ought to make a motion to that effect and we get direction from the entire council so that Stephanie is not having to just, you know, respond to individual requests, that, it, that it's a, a group decision by the entire governing authority. Let me point out one, th one thing. Uh, even after we, if we interviewed all 14, then what process do we use to narrow it down? Because we've got 14, you know, there's six of us that needs to vote on 14 people. What's the process? So some letter is going to have to be narrowed down before or after the interview. And that you have the, the, the right to talk about in executive session to, as to how to narrow it down. <clears throat> You may choose after the interviews that we don't like any of these applicants and that you then move into doing something with the Tier 2 people or completely change the process altogether. Uh, with regard to the Tier 2 and, and the, the totality, David, do you have an opinion? You've heard uh, what we've talked about. I'd, yeah, I, I'll refer to that. I, I, I think it is perfectly reasonable for you all to take a look at the second group of, of candidates also because they are people that, although they didn't meet our primary criteria, again, you correct me if I'm wrong, they didn't meet the, the big goal of having somebody with prior managerial experience. They are people who, uh, you know, did have significant other local government experience. So I don't think it's unreasonable for you to to ask to look at those, the, 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 the group of people who really don't meet any of the qualifications, I, I think it's going to be appropriate for just to no, us to notify them that, um, that we have many other qualified applicants that have quali qualifications better than them. Okay. Well, I'll make you say sure. not prior um, managerial. You're talking about city city manager. So, because I I remember an applicant. I won't get too specific here, but um, engineer had handled a bunch of different projects. Had worked in city government. Had really done a number of things that even a city manager would do in their position. I don't want to rule those kind of people out. Um, and that that's why I want that second tier because somebody like that would fit right in there. And the only other thing I was going to ask you legally, it sounds like you're saying legally we can't involve any business people from the community to not necessarily make the decision, but be involved in this process? Is that unethical, illegal? I mean, it, it, at this point, yes, it would be, I think. I, and now I've, I've heard comments from people who I respect very, very greatly about have, using resources within the community that have expertise in doing some of these things that we may not have. And I'm still working to try and figure out a way to do that. I, I'm fairly certain that we can, can do that when we get down to that final three, whose names we have to make public. Uh, because th at that point in time, there's no reason that we have to treat these people as being confident, you know, their resumes as being confidential. Uh, if, if, we, if we start giving it our resumes around to other people in the community, and, and that's why I made the point, it's, it's really just the six of you and, and not people that you trust or people that, you know, that you think could, could advise you well. But those are confidential documents because people in some ways have, have put their existing jobs on the line by applying here. Uh, may I ask Stephanie, how many are in Tier 2? I am not exactly sure. I would say probably 30. 30? Mm -hmm. well, I appreciate that a lot of folks want to give us a, a shot, mm -hmm. but I want to see them. So is it appropriate to make a motion now? Yes. I'll make uh, a motion that we see all of the Tier 1 and Tier 2 candidates and any candidates that come in after you give us these packets. That all meet the minimum the, qualifications, of course. Of that one or two. those two groups, yeah. Of one or two. Correct. Be supplied immediately to the council. Second that. Okay. 
have a motion and a second that we review all the Tier 1 and Tier 2 candidates, including those Tier 1 and Tier 2 candidates who come in after today, this process. Uh, have a motion and a second. Discussion? If not, all in favor? Two, three, all opposed? Was that a no or did you vote yes? I vote yes. Okay, mm -hmm. unanimous. Okay, uh, tab C, executive session. Yeah, I would uh, ask that the council adjourn into executive session in that for a meeting to discuss or deliberate upon the appointment, employment, compensation, hiring, disciplinary action, or dismissal, or periodic evaluation or rating of a public officer or employee as provided in Georgia Code Section 50-14-3B2. Make that motion. Second. A motion second to adjourn into executive session. All in favor? Unanimous. We are in executive session shortly. Nobody's up here playing around.